Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Georgia Harper. I am policy manager at Autistica, uh, and I'll be the host for today. Um, we're lucky enough to be joined today by Sarah Cassidy, who will lead today's webinar on influencing suicide prevention policy in partnership with autistic people. For those of you who are new to us, Autistica is the UK's leading autism research and campaigning charity. We create breakthroughs to enable autistic people to live happy, healthy and long lives. We do this through research, shaping policy and working with autistic people to make more of a difference. A big part of that is sharing the latest research and evidence-based practice, which is what we're all doing here today. The topic today is a very difficult one. Uh, we encourage you to take a break if you need to. Again, the webinar is being recorded. You can come back later. Um, and if you do need to speak to someone, please do reach out to a trusted person or contact Samaritans. The phone number is 116123, or you can email joe at samaritans.org. Um, okay, thank you. I'll now hand over to Sarah. Thanks so much, uh, Georgia, and thanks to Team Autistica for inviting me to do this webinar, and also to everybody um, joining me here today. It's really appreciated. So the idea of this webinar really is for me to speak as little as possible. And that's what I'm going to aim to do because I want to spend most of the time um, discussing, getting your feedback, your views uh, that will help to feed into the next stages of our work and to answer your questions. So I'm just going to give a very brief background about the available research evidence regarding suicidal thoughts and behaviors on autistic people, what we did in our priority setting exercises, what did that actually entail? And what has been the impact of that work on policy so far? And then I want to spend as much time as possible, really, discussing what needs to happen next. And there's opportunity for everybody in the audience to get involved by giving your anonymous answers to three questions. And I've got them listed here and they were sent around in advance as well. If you don't feel like you've got enough time because we're only going to have like five to seven minutes for people to write in their uh, anonymous answers. Please don't worry because I'm going to leave the Padlet open for two weeks after this webinar. So if you don't feel like you've got time or space or feel time pressured to come up with answers to those questions or you want to amend your question or add other things, then just keep a note of the uh, QR code and link. We're gonna send it around afterwards with a copy of these slides. So if you need a little bit more time to think about your responses, there will be plenty of time for that. So if you just want to sit back and listen and think and ask questions in this webinar and think about these afterwards, then that is totally fine. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what will happen after the webinar. So why are we doing this? Why am I asking you for your views and what will that help make happen um, after? So suicide, ill thoughts and behaviours and autistic people, what do we know? Well, we know now from a number of international studies and a number of studies that have looked across whole populations, the autistic people are very sadly more likely to die by suicide than non-autistic people. There's a significantly increased risk. And the highest risk is in autistic people without co-occurring intellectual disability, and particularly in autistic women as well. And that's compared to non-autistic women. So what that means is that autistic men and women are uh, at equally high risk of dying by suicide. But this is a different pattern to in the general population where men, non-autistic men in the general population are significantly more likely to die by suicide than women, whereas this gender difference doesn't appear to be the case in the autistic population. So when we say the highest risk of death by suicide in autistic women, we mean compared to non-autistic women. And we know that this increased risk of suicide amongst autistic people has been found in a number of countries in Australia, the US and Canada, to name a few. And we're also finding the same pattern in the UK as well. And just to reiterate, autistic men and women are both at similarly high risk of suicide, but the gender difference is particularly in that autistic women are significantly more likely to die by suicide than non-autistic women because they're 
that gender difference that we see in the general population disappears in the autistic community. We also know um, that 1% of the population is autistic approximately. More recent prevalence studies have shown that it's higher than this. Um, but even considering that, we know that autistic people are overrepresented in groups at high risk for uh, attempting suicide and dying by suicide, regardless of whether they have been diagnosed or not. So I'm going to show you a few statistics to illustrate that. So in 11 to 15 percent of patients who have been hospitalized for attempting suicide and are at risk for attempting suicide uh, in depressed patients and patients with borderline personality disorder, when studies have assessed all of those um, people for autism, they found that 11 to 15 percent of those people met criteria for an autism diagnosis, but they hadn't yet been diagnosed. So that's a really, really high percentage of undiagnosed autistic people in the highest risk group um, for attempting suicide who didn't previously know that they are autistic. 41.4% of people uh, in a study I led recently in the UK where we interviewed uh, friends and family of those who died and looked at medical records and coroner's inquest records, found a really, really high percentage of those people had high autistic traits indicating possible undiagnosed autism. So 41% of people who died by suicide in the UK might be autistic, but haven't yet been diagnosed. And similarly, about 41% of people who have attempted suicide at some point in their life, uh, who don't suspect that they might be autistic, who don't have family members who are autistic, um, they nevertheless report significantly, clinically significantly high levels of autistic traits indicating that they may uh, possibly be autistic but not yet diagnosed. And in a systematic review where we looked at all the available studies on this topic, we found similarly high rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviours in autistic and possibly autistic people. So those are people who um, self-identify as autistic but aren't yet diagnosed. So it doesn't seem to uh, matter or it, it's very, very high, similarly high rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviours, regardless of whether a person is diagnosed or self-identifies as autistic or is later diagnosed um, as autistic. So we need to think of uh, supports, interventions, research um, for autistic people who are diagnosed and those who are not yet diagnosed and those who may not even know or suspect that they might be autistic. We need to reach all of these groups of autistic people. So we know that autistic people are at increased risk of suicide compared to non-autistic people. But when we looked uh, at the available um, international research and kind of policy relevant to this, we were quite surprised that there's very, very little research on suicide in autistic people. And particularly what we don't know about, although there's a lot of research on the scale of the issue, which is very, very important to show that autistic people are at increased risk, including undiagnosed autistic people. What we don't know is what kind of increases or decreases that risk. What are the risk and protective factors and what kind of prevention or intervention strategies should we be developing? What are the service gaps? What can make a real difference in supporting autistic people? What are the best times to step in and help an autistic person to prevent or lower their risk of suicide? Um, very, very little research available on that. And what we were very surprised about is that there was nowhere in the world, in no country, no relevant government policies for suicide prevention, which mentioned autistic people. So despite being a very high risk group, autistic people didn't have any kind of policies or government strategies or healthcare strategies on a national level in any country to help address and try to lower and prevent uh, this risk. So we thought, well, we must work with autistic people and those who support them to set those future research and policy priorities, because previous research and policy kind of decisions, they're very rarely made with or for 
autistic people. They're made by non-autistic people. And therefore, the research that gets done and the policies that get made, um, they miss the mark a lot and don't necessarily address the issues that are important or useful or acceptable to autistic people and those who support them. And that can slow down our progress. And that's why we thought it's really, really important to work in partnership with autistic people from the start to make sure that the kind of research that gets done, the kind of policy recommendations that get made um, actually take into account the views of those affected so that they're more useful and don't miss the mark. So what do we do? Well, we started off uh, with some funding. I got a postdoctoral research fellowships. This is very early on in my career, kind of around uh, 2016, 2017, where I got a postdoctoral research fellowship from the Economic and Social Research Council to set up the Mental Health in Autism project. And I ran some workshops as part of um, the research that I was doing that was developing a new uh, mental health measures with and for autistic adults to better capture depression, suicidal thoughts and behaviours um, in autistic people. And I got together you know, a number of public engagement events, two workshops where I had equal representation actually of autistic people, um, their family members, researchers, clinicians, service providers and charities. And I just discussed with them very openly, what, what kind of research do you want to see? What kind of practice changes do we need to make happen? Uh, what kind of policies would be useful? And I just identified very, very broad topic areas from those two workshops. And then I was very fortunate um, to be supported by the largest autism specific conference in the world. It's predominantly a research conference and it's called INSAR the International Society for Autism Research, and they hold an annual meeting. And um, I was supported by them to run three special interest groups. And these are really, really great events because it brings lots of people from all over the world interested in a particular understudied topic to discuss what should be the next steps um, for this topic in terms of research policy practice. And in the first year, we had quite a small group attend, so 40 um, people attended. But in year three, we had over 100 attending, which was almost double, showing the growth in interest in this area. And we didn't just, although it's a predominantly research conference, we didn't just have researchers attend. We also had autistic people, autism advocates, family members, charities and some policymakers as well. Um, from the US and other countries who are really interested uh, in this area. And we managed to hone down um, a number of kind of interesting discussion points and ideas. And after mm -hmm. that, uh, I was also very fortunate to get funding from Autistica, funding and support from Autistica, to take forward, you know, the questions that we developed and identify, uh, hone these down a bit more and identify 48 questions and some policy and practice recommendations. And we did that in association with an independent organization called the James End Alliance Priority Setting Partnership. And the James End Alliance specializes in bringing together researchers with those affected by the research topic, in this case, autistic people uh, with experience of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, and identify priorities for research in particular, but also they supported us with um, uh, kind of uh, um, organizing the discussion so we could get some policy and practice recommendations related to the research priorities. And 40 autistic people and those who support them, equal representation of both groups attended that meeting. And then after that, I got some funding again from the International Society for Autism Research, again in association with the James Lind Alliance who independently facilitated this work. Um, and that was to write an INSAR policy brief. And that enabled us to do uh, a few more studies to take forward those 48 questions and policy and practice recommendations. We had a large online survey with 788 autistic people and those who support them. A majority of those who took part in the survey were autistic. They ranked those 48 research questions online and produced, you know, gave us kindly more policy ideas. And then in a meeting with 30 autistic people and those who support them, again, equal representation of those groups, 
they identified the top 10 research priorities and some key policy asks. So a lot of work and a lot of consultation over a number of years with support from a lot of organisations, which we're very grateful for, um, developed uh, our kind of uh, top recommendations and a policy brief. So these are the top 10 kind of research questions that we designed um, together through this stakeholder kind of exercise. But the top one was what barriers do autistic people experience when seeking help, which might put them at greater risk of suicide, number of questions about risk and protective factors, about being believed, um, understanding differences between the nature and experience of suicidal thoughts and behaviours in autistic and non-autistic people, how we should best assess people, um, how should we develop interventions, um, etc. And you can see how these research questions also directly relate to kind of our policy asks and um, really, really important areas to develop practical recommendations and we in particular focused on the top one about barriers so in our policy brief we discussed well it's going to take a quite a long time to develop get funding and develop research addressing this so what can we do now what kind of recommendations can we make to policymakers now before the uh, results of longer term research become available so we can make a difference sooner. And these are the um, recommendations that we put in our policy brief to policymakers about this top priority about removing barriers. And it included things like identifying autistic and possibly autistic people as high risk groups for suicide and suicide prevention policy and clinical guidelines because that hadn't happened yet develop partnerships with autistic people and those who support them to ensure that future and policy and practice is appropriate, having legislation requiring mental health services to provide autistic people with services for co-occurring conditions. Because what we're finding in research and from the experiences of people who took part in our survey about what needs to change, we know that there's a service gap where autistic people are being um, referred out of mainstream mental health services that don't necessarily have expertise in autism, um, who say, we don't we don't have, you know, the necessary expertise, you should go to an autism specific service, but there isn't one. So autistic people are falling through the gaps and not getting the support that they need. Um, improving systems of autism diagnosis across the lifespan, but not just that, also providing appropriate post-diagnostic mental health treatment and support post-diagnosis because a lot of autistic people were telling us in our research and again in our online consultation survey that this just wasn't happening you just get the, your diagnosis you're given a leaflet and and that's it like what well what happens next well there isn't anything also developing guidelines to ensure that service providers actually recognize high risk for suicide in autistic people and giving them the necessary knowledge and skills to provide appropriate treatment and support because we understand that because there's such a lack of research a lack of interventions and um, uh, uh, kind of evidence regarding what support looks like ideal support looks like and what will work um, we need to change that to empower clinicians and services to be able to better support autistic people as well um, developing accessible and personalised support and treatment because there isn't a lot of research regarding that and not a lot of options yet available and developing accreditation to recognise the mental health service providers who excel in the successful support of autistic people was another um, widely kind of endorsed suggestion to try and help change things. So we published our policy brief. Um, here's a copy of it and I've got a link to it at the end. Uh, if you want to learn more about it and read it yourself, we shared it widely with policymakers and were approached by NHS England saying that there was a opportunity to feed into areas in the next suicide prevention strategy that's published every five years by the Department for Health and Social Care. It's an important government policy document. It highlights a number of um high priority areas for the government to tackle with regard to suicide prevention. And really delighted to say it's a really, really big step for us um, that this new document, the most recent um, 
version of this that was published in September 2023 finally recognises for the very first time autistic people as a high risk group for suicide. It's, autism and autistic people has its own section in this report. And it doesn't only recognise diagnosed autistic people, it also recognises because of the research that I just outlined at the beginning of this presentation, that also undiagnosed autistic people are also a high risk group for suicide. So we don't only need to help diagnosed autistic people because we know that diagnosis can take a long time, really long waiting lists, a lot of barriers to getting a diagnosis. We also need to help undiagnosed autistic people, including those who might not know yet know that they're autistic. So we know from previous research, research that um, that is also a high risk group as well. It also recognises that we need to improve access to autism diagnosis and mental health support um, post-diagnosis and also before a diagnosis. And it also recognises that we need to consider results of ongoing trials of, uh, and um, uh, research looking at what ideal support or personalised support might look like. And one example of a study that we've just uh, completed actually, but was still ongoing at the time of publication of this report, is considering results of autism adapted safety planning research, for example. And more participatory research to inform suicide prevention policy, which is really excellent because the government is realising we need to continue to work in partnership with autistic people to make sure that the research, the interventions, the recommendations being made, actually, they don't miss the mark. They're, they're doing um, helpful things that are acceptable to autistic people and those who support them as well. So this is all good. This is this is a really really good step that the government has made this recommend this recognition important, but there are some issues. The policy is very high level aspirational aims, and there's nothing particularly wrong with that. We want to be aspirational. We want to know where we want to be. The problem is that there isn't much in the um, policy about how we get there. So how do we actually achieve these things? So we know we want to have better autism diagnosis and better support, but how will we achieve that and what will it look like? And if we don't do that work and make the recommendations to answer those questions, then what we found from previous kind of experience of the autism strategy and other policies, particularly relevant to autism, is that things don't change. And in some instances they can get even worse. So we need to continue to work with autistic people and those who support them to help develop those recommendations. And the good time to do it, well, the best time to do it is now. And to continue that work, we've made policymakers aware that there's an issue and the kind of things that need to change, but now we need to work together to tell policymakers about exactly what changes need to happen and make sure that any kind of services that we get as a result of the strategy actually reflect the needs and priorities of autistic people and those who support them. So we don't end up with something that doesn't work or isn't acceptable or that we you know, really don't like. So this is where I'm going to try and stop talking um, because in order to do this, it, there's no good in me deciding what the support should look like. As a non-autistic researcher, I need the help and input of autistic people and those who support them to begin this process, much like we did uh, for the first set of recommendations to get to the next stage. We need your input. So I'm going to start with three questions. And the reason that I chose these questions was on consultation with some of the people who took part in the initial stage of the exercise, also with uh, colleagues at Autistica as well, um, and also kind of building upon the work that we've already done because they relate um, to the priorities that we've, we've already found. But I want to really focus on how we can kind of make the suicide prevention strategy aims a reality. And I think in order to do that, I really, really need to know, well, what does ideal support for autistic people actually look like? How can we actually implement effective preventative support from the point of view of diagnosis or identifications? Not only being diagnosed, but self-identifying. Um, 
as autistic uh, before a diagnosis or even if a person chooses not to be diagnosed but prefers to self-identify given all the difficulties in getting a diagnosis and how can we support autistic people to recognize they are in crisis and seek help so i'm going to go through each question in turn there's going to be five minutes about to focus on each question um, there's going to be some space to ask questions through the chat enter anonymous ideas on Padlet. And like I said at the start, if you've joined more recently, don't worry if this is all a bit too much to kind of race noting down your answers within that five minutes. These Padlets are gonna be open for two weeks. So if you just want to sit back, listen, think, ask questions, and then fill out the Padlet afterwards within the next two weeks, that's totally fine because it will still be available. So this is the QR code and also there'll be a link posted in the chat uh, Q&A so that you can click on it and access the Padlet. Um, so you can scan it on your phone or click on the link. Um, you can use anything. You can use a phone, tablet, computer. Any is totally fine. And uh, it's completely anonymous. Your name won't be posted or anything like that. Um, all you do is click on the plus button. I've got it highlighted with a red box around it. And then you can just add your anonymous ideas to each question. So the first question, let's spend five to seven minutes having a look at this. Um, have a look at the Padlet. You'll be able to see what other people are posting. You'll be able to comment, like things. Um, but what do I mean by this? It's a very, very open question and I appreciate that, but I think it's important to be open to get your ideas, but there are no right or wrong answers to this. Everything that you say will be useful. And you'll also notice on the Padlet that there's a final section saying, if I've missed anything, or you think that these questions are just not the right questions, then please feel free to post your feedback, post your own questions and say, I don't think you should be asking this. I think you should be asking that that's really, really useful. So there's kind of a, a fourth column for that too. But what do I mean by this question? Um, the suicide prevention strategy says that post-diagnostic support and mental health support needs to improve for autistic people. But what? how should this ideal support, what should it look like? What, what kind of ethos should it have? Uh, what should it include? What would you like? policy makers, services, practitioners to know about how to best support autistic people experiencing suicidality. So put your feedback in that Padlet about what you think ideal support for autistic people should look like. I'm going to stay silent for three more minutes um, to give people an opportunity to put their ideas into the Padlet. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure that you're still putting um, your ideas or just having a think about that previous question. Just had a look at the time and we should probably um, carry on to the next one. So this one's about how can we implement effective preventative support from the point of view of diagnosis or identification that includes self-identification. Um, so self-identifying as autistic or perhaps suspecting that one might be autistic, but not yet diagnosed. We've had to think about what ideal support for autistic people might look like, but how can it actually be implemented? So what would you like policymakers, services, or practitioners to know about how to best implement support for autistic people before reaching crisis point? So what I mean by that is not just thinking about, well, how will it be, how can we implement it at crisis point where a person has reached suicidal crisis, but how can we actually prevent that happening? Things like um, maybe supporting, you know, employment or uh, education or anything else that could help prevent an autistic pe person reaching that crisis point. So not just thinking about what crisis support looks like, but things that could help before, way before or prevent that from ever happening kind of in the first place. What kind of things do we need to implement um, to look at suicide prevention, not just helping people when they reach that point, but actually stopping 
that happening in the first place. So I will um, stop talking for about three more minutes just to give people an opportunity to fill in um, their ideas for this section as well. So thanks for everybody who's um, added their thoughts so far. That's really, really great. Um, so I'll go on to the uh, third question. So how can we support autistic people to recognise when they're in crisis and seek help? This is a really big theme in previous research and was also a big theme in our consultation exercise as well, because research shows autistic people can find it difficult to identify and know when they're approaching crisis and to seek help. And this is what our autism adapted safety plan study um, tried to address by helping autistic people to know when they're approaching crisis and seek help. But there might be lots of other strategies available as well that we haven't thought of um, that could also be useful. So let us know your suggestions from research, lived experience, clinical experience, anything which has helped yourself and or others um, to help identify when they're approaching crisis and to seek help. So I'll give three minutes for everybody to put in their ideas for this third question. And remember that there is a fourth column for uh, questions that we've kind of missed or things that you think that we should be looking at but aren't in these three questions. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, quite a few kind of comments and ideas have come through which are really, really useful. So what will happen next? Why are we asking you for this information? Well, we're going to write a summary of this workshop, the kind of things that I've talked about and the recommendations overall and the ideas kind of submitted. And that summary will be shared with everybody who attended this webinar and more widely, including funders and policymakers. Um, it would be um, shown in terms of groups of individuals so the kind of themes that have emerged um, and uh, anonymous kind of quotes. But that will really help us shape the next stages of our research and policy impact work. It will really help us to support funding applications for future workshops to further develop and expand on the ideas submitted today. Um, we found that really, really useful in our previous work. And it will help feed into guidelines for policymakers, services and practitioners to help them actually implement that recent suicide prevention policy with and for autistic people. Um, so it help us, it's on a long road to the next step. So thanks so much for, for taking part. Um, thank you also to everybody who was involved in the initial you know, stages of the work. It was um, a real team effort. It involved a lot of organizations, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, over a thousand uh, people taking part and joining me on this journey. And thanks for continuing the journey with me. I've also got links if you want to know anything more about the suicide prevention strategy, um, the information about our inside policy brief, a copy of the policy brief, more kind of information about how we actually undertook the exercise uh, in lots of different formats. Um, including kind of video summaries and things and a copy of the link to our website that's got details of our research all of our publications and all our research all our resources just to reiterate again that those padlets will be open for another two weeks so if you want more time to think and you want to add to it at a later date or if you're looking read you know listening to um the recording of this webinar and still want to take part then hopefully there'll still be opportunity for you to do so. So I'll stop uh, sharing my screen and I'm open to any questions that people have. Um, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, that was really interesting. It was great to see some of the discussion on Padlet as well. Um, so if you do have any questions, please put those in um, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we've had a few through already. Um, so first of all, the um, the figure you mentioned at the start of the webinar, 41.4% um, of people, I think that is 
um, possible like people who die by suicide who could be autistic. Um, does that include those who already had a formal diagnosis of autism um, at the time, or was this more, more of a focus on traits? No, it's more focused on traits. So that figure does not include those who were diagnosed as autistic before they died. Um, this is looking looking just at traits. And um, I can't remember exactly how many, but quite a few were on the diagnostic pathway before they died. I know that much. Thank you. Um, we've had another question through um, that says, I'm currently a law student, uh, considering working in the Court of Protection. Uh, I was wondering if there are any resources available so that I can best support my autistic clients. Yes, there are. And this isn't a particular kind of focus of my research um, specifically, but there's some really brilliant research by somebody called Katie Maris, um, looking at how to support autistic clients in lots of different areas of anything involving kind of law um, and courts. So I could point you towards their research. Um, they've got some really, really great practical guideline guidance. Thank you. Um, and then we've had a question through about um, LGBTQ plus autistic people in particular. Um, an area uh, this person says that many autistic people say to me um, is sort of sexuality issues. And do you have any information, research, and so on about suicide in LGBTQ plus autistic adults? And to what extent does the, uh, the suicide prevention strategy uh, focus on this group? That's a really, really excellent and important question. It's something that has been understudied but it needs to be studied. And that is something that was discussed um, in our priority setting exercise, but it was kind of as part of the risk and protective factors um, discussion, um, but gender uh, really re and gender identity really, really came into that as well. We know from our research that we've had a higher, a much higher rate of um, LGBTQ plus genders um, taking part in our research uh, compared to the general population. But there haven't been, to my knowledge, any specific studies on it yet, but they really, really need to happen. Did any of your research uh, indicate an increased risk of crisis with uh, alexithymia? Um, it might be helpful, actually, for those who don't know, to explain a little bit about what alexithymia means. Yeah, so alexithymia is difficulty in um, describing and identifying your own internal emotional experiences. And it sort of feeds into, and it's been a really, really key part, like theme of our research, in particularly autistic people, you know, saying things like, well, I don't know how I feel on a typical day. So I don't really know if I'm approaching crisis. And that's a real difficulty because. I can just, it just happens kind of explosively in the moment. Um, and I don't really know how to cope with it and I can't really pre-plan what will happen. And our safety plan study um, tried to develop, uh, co-develop co a way of working with autistic people to help them identify those warning signs for suicidal crisis and come up with a plan to help them keep them safe. Um, so that is a, a really, really important point. I don't think it's been explored in a, a specific study, although it has in the general population. There's so many things, there's so many risk factors that we know are factors in the general population, but haven't yet really been explored in autistic people. So a lot of research about the why and the risk and protective factors really still needs to happen, which is why it's on that list of top you know, research questions that are really, really important that autistic people and those who support them who have prioritised. But we definitely have found it as a theme in our qualitative research and in our safety planning study. And also when I was developing the um, uh, suicidality uh, assessment tool with and for autistic adults as well, that came up as a theme. So I do think it's really important, but again, to my knowledge, a quantitative study 
that has actually looked at the correlation, again, hasn't really happened yet. Thank you. Um, we've also had a question through about uh, autistic people with eating disorders. Um, and we know that, for example, anorexia is especially prevalent in this group. Um, are you aware of any research in terms of the links um, between sort of autism and eating disorders and suicide? I do know of some really excellent work by Will Mandy and colleagues that have looked at um, I think it's actually funded by Autistica, uh, some really, really excellent work looking at uh, the prevalence and nature of eating disorders in autistic people and how best to identify and uh, treat eating disorders in autistic people. But again, as far as I know, there hasn't been um, kind of risk studies looking at, you know, whether autistic people with co-occurring, you know, eating disorders and a whole host of other disorders actually like mental health conditions how that increases risk of suicidality there have been a few studies that have looked at um, mental health problems such as depression anxiety um, camouflaging and other mental health conditions but i don't know if it's included eating disorders specifically thank you um we've had another question through from a mental health charity um, that are seeking to adapt their suicide prevention program to meet the needs of autistic people. Um, they've said, while our program is holistic, our main offering is group therapy and uh, the social aspect may be a barrier. Um, how do you think they could ease that transition into a sort of community setting for autistic people? Well, one of the things that came through on the Padlet that I've heard a lot of other people also suggest is um, peer support. So, um, and also I think offering, and this is what we find in our research as well, when we're doing our safety plan study and other studies, is offering different ways to access um, support because one size won't fit all. And some autistic people may actually really benefit from and like, you know, small group sessions with other autistic people experiencing similar things. Those kind of peer support and social support groups um, can be really beneficial. We run a uh, support, kind of social support group at our university for autistic students, and it's really popular as a group. So it's more about offering choice. Um, and different kind of ways of accessing uh, your service. So that might be on a one-to-one -one basis, it might be online, it might be a text-based service or a text chat, um, like an online chat might work for some people. It's about offering kind of choice. But I would say involving autistic people in what that kind of support looks like, maybe having autistic people who are already kind of involved in your service who have some suggestions about how it might be uh, how it might work for different people um with different kind of access needs would would also be a good idea but just keeping an open mind and not making any assumptions about what might and might not work thank you um and similarly we've had a question through about suicide crisis hotlines um and the support that they may or may not offer for autistic people. Um, for example, this person says we communicate differently and require questions that are direct and not laced with context. Um, I guess, yeah, what, what sort of experience um, the people you work with have had with those kind of helplines and uh, do you have any advice in terms of how to adapt those? Yeah, so um, I think that's a really, really good question as well. It sort of needs its own study because we don't have, you know, a study about what the kind of um, best access, you know, would be. But some of the kind of um, general really useful feedback that we had through our priority setting exercise is, and it was actually included in our policy brief, is that picking up the phone and having conversation with somebody can be really, really difficult, really, really anxiety provoking. And just having some alternatives to that. So being able to text, for instance, um, can be a lot easier um, rather than, you know, having to pick up the phone and, and speak to somebody. 
uh, that was a main theme. And I think it's been shown in quite a few other studies as well. Um, and there might be other things like, say, for instance, with um, some kind of suicide prevention kind of hotlines, it it might be that um, people of the over the phone ask very are trained to ask very, very open questions, very, very open and that can be really, really difficult as well. But again, working in partnership with autistic people who have experience of accessing that service and have some um, suggestions about how you can kind of adapt those questions or other kind of um, ways of accessing the service, I think is, is really, really important. Thank you. Uh, and I think probably the last question um, we've had a question through around um, trauma uh, and neurodiversity um, and how is uh, how is trauma informed practice essentially being explored within this this research? That's really, really important. Uh, and again, a really, really under investigated area. Um, we're at that stage of the research. So for a lot of these kind of answers, I say that's a really excellent question. It's something that we need to do. Uh, but there's just so there is so much more to do. Trauma in autistic people, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, and all of these things are really, really under investigated in autistic people. The research is only just starting to be done. Uh, but I know of a really, really ex at least one excellent project led by a colleague, um, Don Adams, um, in partnership with other colleagues at Strathclyde University, looking at the intersection between suicidal thoughts and behaviours in autistic people and trauma using art-based methods, um, which is really, really interesting. But I think I just think it's a really, really important point and something that that needs to be explored as part of, you know, what does ideal support look like? Thank you. Uh, and I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. Um, but thank you so much for all your questions. They really do allow us to dig a little bit deeper into such an important topic. And thank you for all of your participation on the Padlet as well. I think that's going to stay open um, for a little while longer if you do have any additional thoughts. As I mentioned earlier, this is a really difficult topic and I encourage you to take a short break after the session. Do whatever helps you to reset whether that's going for a walk, having a cup of tea, whatever helps you. And if you do need to speak to someone, please reach out to a trusted person or contact Samaritans. That's 116123 by phone, or you can email joe at samaritans.org. That's J-O at samaritans.org. You can also refer to the resources um, that we're going to be sharing uh, through the mailing list uh, after the session. All that's left for me to say is... A huge thank you to Sarah for sharing uh, your work with us today and for answering the questions so thoughtfully. It's been an absolute pleasure having you with us. Uh, thank you so much, everyone.